Okay, what I want to talk about today is the difference between no condemnation and guilt. No condemnation and guilt, and we can also add in there the emotion of being corrected. Okay, three things. It's the difference between no condemnation, we know the verse in the Bible, we're going to read it this morning, where it says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And we confuse that, that word no condemnation with guilt, or the emotion of feeling guilty. Um, and I've seen it, you know, over the last, I would say, two years, that whenever you would correct someone, you know, you cannot use anything in the Bible where Paul was talking about correction, or I wouldn't even say correction when, or correction when it comes to actions, but correction concerning belief, because people will say, so are you actually saying I'm wrong? And then they feel condemned, or they feel guilty, and then they say there's no condemnation for me, you know? Um, and actually missing such a great part of the good news of the gospel. Uh, and I've realized, and, and I'm so thankful for this, and I said it last Sunday, and when I listened to the message, I realized that I never completed what I wanted to say. And that was, um, in the beginning, when I just got a hold of the grace message, I was so thankful that God is not angry with me when I do something wrong. And that He keeps no book of any sin that I commit, and that He will never deal with me, ever deal with me, based on what I do, be it good or bad. He deals with me based on who He is. I don't determine Him. Who He is determines Him. Okay? So, and He is love. And we can go and look at all the attributes of love in Luke chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You know, where it says, you know, love does not try and parade itself. Love does not seek its own. Love gives. Love never dies. And it says God is love. So who God is, He lives towards me. doesn't matter how I live. He can only be Himself. And I was so happy for that message. And that basically gave me so much life. But as I studied out uh, more and in my relationship with God, I realized that that is... Um, how can I say, w that is the foundation of the gospel. Without that, I cannot even enter into a relationship with God because guilt and works righteousness will completely destroy my life. Okay, because I will be so busy doing things for God that I can never experience God's quality of life. Okay? But I've come to realize this, and this is what gives me such great joy. God has saved me from a place where I am enslaved by the law system to my own flesh, which I will explain now. He saved me from that unto a place where I can experience His quality of life and where I can function exactly the way He functions. That I can actually experience that which He has created me for. Okay? God has made man so that someone can experience what it is to be like Him and to function like Him. And if we look at who He is and how He functions, this is who He is. He is a being that cannot but want others to share in His quality of life. He is a person that is influential. In other words, who He is is so powerful that it recreates who He is in whosoever believes in Him. And that is who we are. We have been created in His image and in His likeness, and inside every human being, that is our natural life. That's who we are. And anything but that will produce frustration in your life. Even knowing, and this is what, I, what I've seen in my life, knowing that God will not be angry with me if I um, commit a sin. Okay? That gives great joy when you have committed a sin. But continual commitment of something that's not in line with you will still produce frustration in your life. Although God always loves you. I mean, if God doesn't... Look, look at the, the prodigal son. When the prodigal son went and squandered his whole inheritance, the father was never angry with him. 
And it was the memory of the good father that empowered him to go back home. He knew two things. That his father is good. My father is even good to the servants. So let me go back and tell my father that I'm sorry and make me a servant because at least he'll be good to me. My father is a good God, a good father. The goodness of the father, and like the Bible says in Romans 2 verse 4, it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. But can you see that even if he had, and, and I'm sure in that prodigal son's life, there was many times when he was thinking of the goodness of the father. But he was living a life that frustrated him, for he was never meant to tend of the pigs. That was not his design. His design was to function as a prince or the son of the father. That was who he was made to be. That was the father's original plan. So I do believe that we cannot experience quality of life in this life outside of having a life that is founded on belief that you are equal with God, that you are the God kind, and to be in such a place where who He is influences you so much that who He is manifests in you effortlessly. Okay? Having that fruit, that joy. I just saw now again when I went to Zambia, the joy of just caring for somebody. I challenge you, you know, when you feel, and, and, and this thing we must remember, in the New Testament, we don't function by laws anymore. We don't function by, you must love your neighbor. We don't function by, you must give to the poor. We don't function by, you must go to church. There's no such law anymore. The new law is this. This is the law. When you hear the good news, it will produce a persuasion in your heart. As you yield to that persuasion, who He is will bring forth desires in your heart. And then you follow the desire of your heart. That's the law of life in Christ. That's the new law. The old law was, you are bad, and you can have a good life by doing these things. The new law we live under is, when we hear the good news, and it, we follow the persuasion it brings forth in our hearts, Desires will come forth, which we call spirit-led desires, and then you do whatever you want. Because He brings, He works in me to will and to do, so I do whatever I want. And what we must be sensitive to is what you want. Because there's no other form of guidance. There's no other form of guidance. Inside my heart, I always talk practically in my heart, I said, I said to, to Eliana, I said, there's just a desire in my heart to hear in South Africa, you know, care for some people in our community where they struggle, where they are poor. I just feel that in my heart. Now, I must be careful when it comes to that desire because that is the only way in which I'm guided, basically. One of the, or, I mean, God can appear to me, I can hear an audible voice, but that is the deepest most wonderful way in which God speak to me. You know, like, I feel in my heart to care for, and I don't even know exactly where or what, you know, but I, I feel that, and I got some ideas, and I'm going to follow that, my, my family and myself, and we're going to live that out. Because how else are we going to see this quality of life where we are influenced by unconditional love manifest in us if we, are, if we are still waiting for some law and something to be put on our neck to say you must go and do it. If you're waiting for someone to tell you you must go and do it, you're going to wait for eternity because it's never going to happen. God doesn't work that way. God doesn't function that way. He functions by method of design. And He has designed mankind to function like Him. There was nothing on the neck of God that told him, you must love man. There was nothing uh, uh, threatening God telling him, you must create somebody in your image and in your likeness. It was a desire. It was a feeling that, was, that came up in his heart, which was based, uh, um, that came up in his heart because of the foundation of knowing I'm God. And we, we can't say I am God, but we can say we are God kind. 
Amen. And we function from that platform. And that's how we live. That makes the Christian life a wonderful life. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 that we have been created. We are His workmanship. Created unto good works which He has prepared beforehand. Now, I remember when I just got into the grace message, when I hear the word good works, I was scared. Because I connected it to condemnation and I connected it to something I had to do again to get God to love me or to get the stamp of approval over my life. But in the New Testament, it is not something you do to get identity from. It is something that you've been made for. We've been created unto good works. It means, it is easy, what it actually means is, it's easier to function in good works than what it is to function in a work that's not good. And I want to just quickly explain this. There's a difference between good works and dead works in the Bible. A good work is a work that manifests in your life based on the revelation of who you are in Jesus Christ. A dead work is a good work that manifests in your life based on the ministration of death written on stones called the law. Okay, <laughs> let me explain that again. Kom maar gooi so bykie Afrikaans. A goeie werk, a <laughs> goeie werk is dit wat jy doen op grond van die openbaring van die klaargemaakte werk van Christus in jou. A dooie werk is a werk wat plaasvind as gevolg van die bediening van die dood. Die bediening van die dood was met letters of klippe gegrafeer, sê 2 Korintiërs 3. Ok, so, dit is wanneer die bediening of die wet vat, en dan die wet doen, want dit is een wet wat jy moet doen om geseen te wees, of wat jy moet doen om gehoorzaam te wees aan God, en wanneer jy dit dan nou doen, al is die werk een goeie werk wat voorkom, het lyk goed, noem die Bijbel dit dooie werke. Want is die vader van dit is die bediening van die dood. Okay, so please know that I am not trying to put anybody under the law. The law of sin and death. I want to get you under the law of life. The principle that says you'll have God's quality of life free from your effort in this life. And I want to explain that to you, you know, uh, in depth. Let's go to Genesis. I'm just going to read it here. You can just jot this down. Um, Genesis no, I first put in Romans. Let's just put, read Romans here. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through my flesh, God sending His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither it can be. So then, they that are of the flesh cannot please God, but you are not of the flesh, but of the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Okay, so here it clearly says that there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ who do not walk after the flesh, but after the Spirit. It does not say there's no more guilt, although guilt is included there. It says there's no more condemnation. And we need to understand what that word condemnation there means. Now, I'm going to quickly say that, mention the end of my message and then we're going to go through the whole thing that you know exactly where I'm going. <clears throat> Romans chapter 6 verse 1 says, Shall we continue in sin now that we are under grace and not under the law? Then it says, God forbid. Now let me explain that. Because God forbid is almost like, God forbids you to do that. But that's not what it says. The word forbid there means to cease to exist or to stop. So it says, shall we continue to have a life where the law, where my flesh uses the law to bring forth actions of death in my life? Listen to this. He says, now that the law is taken away and we are in grace, shall we continue under the condemnation of the law? He says, no. You will not continue to sin anymore because under the law, 
you resisted sin. But under grace, God forbids sin. So under the law, we tried to live a holy life. We tried to obey the command. We tried to say, well, if God said it, I'm doing it, and the Bible says it, and I'm doing it. And you'll get it right for a while, and then find yourself feeling guilty again because you couldn't qualify to the standard of the law. But now it says here, now that we are under grace, God is the one that's now given us His nature and His desire, so we are not resisting or trying not to sin anymore. We find that God's new nature in us does it. In other words, it's like... um, you know, for me to have the service here. I don't go in the morning and I wake up and I say, well, you know, I resist the sin of not going to church, you know, and not preaching, well, let's organize Niku to preach, I'm just going to be at home. I don't do that. There's a nature in me that wants to come here. So God has resisted it. Not, I'm not. I mean, if you look at Jesus where He is today, do you think that He bites His lip every day trying not to commit a sin? No. The kind of life he has is a holy life. So God does not try to get you to live a holy life. He's trying to give you his life. And believe in that truth. Believe that you have received his life as the only life that you have will manifest his life in you by him and not you. That's effortless life. Glory to God. So he says here in Romans, and then he goes to Romans 7. In Romans 7 he says, you know, we were married to the law. And when we were married to the law, we brought forth the fruit of the law. Which is mentioned in Galatians 5. Which is all manner of sexual immorality and all those kind of things. You know, it mentions um, even lying, stealing, being puffed up. You know, it mentions so many things, and then it even says there, and whatever is not even mentioned here. You know, so it's all bad things you can think of your life, in your life. He says that is the fruit of being married to the law. Not that the law is sin, but our flesh uses this law to bring forth its death in our lives, and it destroys us. Okay, that's what it says. And now he goes on and he says in chapter 7, he says, when I was under the law, sin revived in my life. After I've received Christ, sin revived in my life. And I came to this conclusion that there's two laws in this world. The law of, or the principle that says, when I'm under the Ten Commandments or the law, sin will manifest in me and I cannot stop it. I'm a slave of that sin. And when I'm under the law of life, which is belief in Christ, believing that I'm co-seated with Him, that I'm part of the Godhead by being seated in Him, that God cannot see anything bad in me, that I function the way He functions, that His life is my life, that there's no distance between me and Him, that we, are, we became equal in Christ. When that reality settles in you, you'll find God living His life in you. That's the two laws there is. The law of sin and death, And the law of life. And then Paul says, when I'm under the law of sin and death, this is what I find. Whenever I read and I see, I'm I'm putting in my own words now, I must do this and I must do that, I find that I can't do it. So, I want to, but I can't. And that's when Paul wrote that piece and he said, the good that I want to do, I can't do. And that which I don't want to do, I find that I do. He says, then he said, I'm condemned. I'm condemned to a life of not being able to function according to my original design. I'm condemned unto it. This is the condemnation. Condemned means we are condemned unto something. You know, if you go to a court and you are found guilty, then you are condemned or sentenced unto something. So when we are condemned, uh, in Bible terms here, when it, in, in Romans 7 and 8, when we are under the law, you are found guilty and condemned to a life where you can never do 
or never see God's quality of life in you, but you can perceive it with your eyes. It's almost like the man, Lazarus, that was in hell, and when he, I mean, Lazarus was in heaven, the rich man was in hell, and he could see heaven, but he could never enter it. It's like something you can perceive, but something you cannot enter into. And that's like a living hell. It's a living hell to read the Bible and always see, hear the, the scriptures of love, caring for one another, the fruit of the Spirit that Paul wrote about, the, 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 the supernatural, a life in the Spirit, to see this free life demonstrated, but you can never attain to it. You can never get to it. It's like hell. But what he says here is, when I'm under the law, I'm condemned to that kind of a life. I can't get free from it. Doesn't matter how much I pray, doesn't matter how much I fast, doesn't matter how much I go to church, or how hard I exercise my moral muscle, I can never reach that place. And then he says, who? And, and this is what he says, I find that this body, this human body, when you put it under the law, and you focus on your human ability to, to, to do what you think God tells you to do, you find that you are cursed, basically. You are condemned to never reaching it. And then he says, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Then he says in the last verse in, in Romans 7, I thank God. There is therefore now no more condemnation for those who are in Christ and don't walk after the flesh, but walk after the Spirit. Okay, I've mentioned this a hundred times in the church. For those of you who watch it again, please bear with me. What does it mean to be in the flesh? To be in the flesh means to look at human ability to measure up to God's standard. That's walking in the flesh. The Jews saw walking in the flesh as finding their identity in the fact that they are Jews and obeying the commandments given by Moses. That's walking in the flesh. He says there is now no more a life where you are so bound by things you don't want to do but you do it for those who are in Christ who walk after the revelation of this good news. Amen. I'm not condemned anymore. You know, if we narrow that down just to, well, I don't feel guilty anymore, you know, you might still be condemned without feeling guilty now. Let me explain that. It's like a, 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 a father, you know, that's got sons, and then two of these sons are on drugs. The father does not try and portray or bring guilt to the sons. doesn't want to make them feel guilty, Okay. So the sons know the father loves them. So they know that the father does not bring guilt towards them. So maybe they don't feel guilty, but they're still condemned to a life of enslavement by drugs for they cannot believe in who they are. Are you seeing the difference between condemnation and guilt? When guilt is supposed to be a foreign emotion to every one of us. Like the song we sang, we're not guilty anymore. Because Romans 3 says the law was given so that everybody could become guilty before God. So the emotion of guilt is that which a human being has, and I'm going to define guilt now. <laughs> you know, I was standing this morning, uh, last night, I said, I said to my wife, I said, how will I explain guilt, what guilt is? You know, and this morning I was, I was up early, and I was going through my notes and I was reading and I said, God, I want to explain guilt. And then in the worship here, I got the revelation on how to explain guilt. <laughs> Glory to God. So I'm going to share it with you. Guilt is the emotion Adam and Eve felt the moment they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yes, and that was to be ashamed of your nakedness. Nakedness is defined as inability to measure up to God's standard by willpower. That's why if we look at the emotion of guilt, it, it is, say you are not very good in reading, for instance. Okay, now you are ashamed of it. Okay, I feel, okay, I can't read very good, so now I don't want to read because I, I feel scum. That 
that is the emotion that came in the hearts of Adam and Eve the moment they came under the law. Now the Bible says in Romans that the law was given so that everybody could become guilty. So what happened when the law was given? Everybody knew their inability and all that we did all our life was try and hide our inabilities because we were ashamed of our inability. We were ashamed of our nakedness. But when they were under grace, when, when Adam and Eve lived on the earth, they were naked but not ashamed. Now, in grace, I can tell you now, by my own power, I can never live up to God's standard. By my own power, I can cheat on my wife. I can steal something from somebody. I can squander money. I can do any person under the right circumstances can do anything. Okay? That's how it works. I am not ashamed to say that by my own power, I'm just a miserable nothing. If I must live under the old way of the typical charismatic Pentecostal way of Christianity, I will destroy my own life. I'm not ashamed to say it anymore. I'm not ashamed to say that outside of God's clothing me with His righteousness, I am naked. But when we are in the law, our announcement of our nakedness is to our own shame because you must clothe yourself with fig leaves oh you naked oh you naked and all that the thing was about is how to clothe yourself because we're gonna we're gonna have a magnifying glass spotting out spots of nakedness on people and then say okay are you still naked you clothe yourself here are you naked you clothe yourself there listen let me tell you something. In grace, we are all naked. Okay? But we are not ashamed of our inability. We're not ashamed. The moment Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where they said, we, are, we, we call ourselves, we clothe ourselves not anymore with who God is, but we are clothed by knowing right and wrong. The garment of righteousness that we put on will only be by what we do. They saw that they can never do it. And they had to live by the revelation of we cannot do it. Instead of calling on God, what they did was they try and clothe themselves with fig leaves, signifying the fig tree, signifying the law system. Okay? So guilt to me is that emotion when you know, okay, I should have, but I can't and I'm going to continue to try, it's that feeling of guilt inside you. But what Paul talked about, no condemnation, has got nothing to do with that feeling. It's, it's, it can't even mention in the same paragraph, you can't even mention in the same message. Because what Paul was saying here is, a human being is condemned to a life of destruction and eternal destruction when he lives by works righteousness. Because it doesn't matter how sincere he is or how hard he is. Many people say, well, at least I've been sincere in my heart. God doesn't care about that. You see, but the Bible, the Bible says God judges the thoughts and the intent of the heart. Oh, yes. The heart is your belief system. What God judges is what do you believe? What do you believe? Do you believe in Christ or are you believing in works righteousness? And in works righteousness, you can be very sincere and sincerely wrong, destroying you and many around you. There are many preachers today standing on pulpits preaching all over the world like what I'm doing today, and they are sincere. They want people to have a good life, but they've got the wrong message, and they, their own lives go to waste, and those that follow them, like Jesus said, the blind following the blind, and both fall into the ditch. That's why, to me, you know, I don't want to be angry at a guy that preaches the law. I've preached the law for three years of my life. Not knowing what I was doing, very sincere. But what God was looking at is this man, maybe he's, he tries to be really in line with the law he believes in, but that is still not the life I've intended for him. And God says there's no more condemnation for those that believe the good news. So I've got good news for you and everybody that's watched me over the world. There's no more such a thing as enslavement of the flesh when you can really believe this good news. And the only way for you to really believe the good news is to hear the good news. 
over and over and over and over. You know, the purpose of this service we have here is not, and I want to say it again, it is not to get an offering so that I can buy myself a new shirt. My goodness, that is not the purpose. The purpose of this service here is so that people can hear this good news and have their minds continually washed in the revelation that their original design, the reason why God made them, is to have a friend that He can influence to have His quality of life. That is why God made you. And to have it renewed and renewed so that every person all the time can know for sure that there is no separation between them and God. That there's no law you have to try and follow so that you can measure up to the standard of God. That you are not cursed. That you are blessed. That you're ever well spoken of by the Father. That you can know that all the time. That's the purpose of the service. The purpose of the service is not to say we've grown a big church in Durbanville or something like that. The purpose of broadcasting everything on the internet all over the world is simply for people to have access to this message. That's the only reason. There's no other reason, just that. So that we can see people living who they really are. Amen. Now I want to go to Genesis chapter 3 and I want to talk about how we were made. I want to talk about the blessedness of having the ability to bear fruit. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Okay, you've heard that message of mine many times, and God said, let us make a man. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit said, let us make someone that can share in our quality of life. Because this is too much just for the three of us. We need to have somebody to experience this quality of life. I say it again, God did not make you for the purpose of serving Him. Everything started off by Him serving you. Okay? And He served you by giving you His quality of life and giving you a seat in the Godhead where you, you are the only being that functions like God, man. And you've got dominion over the fish of the sea, over the, all the fowls of the air, and over this earth. That does not mean we've got now the power to slaughter or to whatever, like, like we think we have. What it means there. And, and this is my view of this. I haven't heard it somewhere else, so check it out if you want to go and think about it. The way I believe dominion means the, the life that I have is so powerful that what I experience, nature will experience. Because when Adam sinned, all of nature fell. Okay? That's what happened. When Adam sinned, all of nature fell. All of nature got hurt. All of nature was, was subject to on after eight when Adam fell, okay, because he had dominion. It's like uh, the president of the country has got dominion over everybody. What people, what he says in America or in another country, dominates us because he's got dominion over us. In the same way, mankind has got dominion over this planet. That's how powerful we are. That is the place where what's true in us manifests. Okay, that's how we've been made. Now listen to this. Um, and God said, let us make man image of their own likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in his own likeness, God created him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So what he said here, let me explain this. He said, I created you in my image and my likeness and I blessed you with the ability to have what's in you reproduced in your life. Fruit bearing by God here was a blessing. And I want to explain that. When God was in heaven, he felt in his heart I need to reproduce who I am in something else. I want to see fruit. Okay? I want to see fruit. Then he created man to have the very same ability to have such a quality of life 
that a desire will come forth in him that he will want to see what is in him in others. Okay? And that was Adam and Eve. Then God made the last Adam, Jesus, and he made the Eve, which is us. And he blessed us with this ability that we can reproduce. I want to say it, we with a focus on Jesus. Adam, Jesus, couldn't find, let's, let's, let's look at how the first Adam named the animals. He named all the animals and there was nobody like him. Then God said, it's not good for man to be alone. Let me make him a wife. He took a rib, made Eve, brought Eve to him, and then he said, this is now flesh of my flesh. This is now my kind, with whom I can be one, and through whom I can bear my fruit into this world. So the focus was not on Eve to bear the fruit. Adam was the one that had desire to bring forth more fruit. Eve was given the ability to bear the fruit that he has in his life and that he wants to multiply. Okay? So in our relationship with God, we stand on the Eve side of things. Jesus is the Adam. He's the last Adam. And God said, when, 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 when Jesus was raised from the dead and we were brought forth, what Jesus would have said was, this is flesh of my flesh. This is bone of my bone, the church. This is the one that I can be one with. And the first Adam said, you will leave father and mother and cleave to his wife. Jesus came and cleaves to us. Okay? And he has got the godly ability, as well as we, to produce after his own kind. It's a blessedness to find a desire inside you to see this quality of life that's in you also in someone else. And it is him that has excuse the word, but I want to put it this way, that it can vividly be in your mind. He has impregnated you with His quality of life and what you feel inside your heart, the desire to be good to somebody, the desire to be generous, the desire to share the gospel with others, to invite somebody to a service, to bless someone, is God bearing His fruit in you. Amen. Amen. And we embrace that fruit because we've been blessed with that ability. And I want to say this. You know, I've, I've, uh, um, a lady said it the other day to me and it blessed me so much. She said, the fruit in the promised land was so much bigger than any other fruit. But the fruit in the promised land was not hard work and toil to get it to work. It was net arm to fight. It was for the taking, up for grabs. Amen. The fruit of the promised land. So in the promised land, I want to tell you, there is great fruit. But when you listen to this with a legalistic mindset, you will say, oh my goodness, now I must bear fruit again. No. The Bible says in John 15 that you cannot bear fruit by your own. It is impossible for you. It says, abide in me, and I will abide in you. I'll cling to my wife. What you do is you cling to this truth of who you really are in Christ, and I will bring forth my fruit in you. For there is no more condemnation. I'm not condemned to be the God kind that cannot function as the God kind. There's no more condemnation for me. You know, the other day I spoke to a, a, a person um, that decided to leave his wife. And he says he preaches grace. And he does preach grace. But when it comes to this action, he says, no, this... And, and I said to him, listen, man, I think what you're doing here is wrong. Um, I'm not saying they don't have marital problems. There is marital problems. They're fighting and everything, and it can be sorted out. But then he says, no, it's not God's plan for him to live like that, and he's just divorcing his wife. I said, but why don't you give us a chance just to talk to the two of you and just share this good news, and just uh, because they believe it, but in their marriage there's some areas they struggle. I said, let's just help you. No, 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 it's too late. I said to you, my brother, and this is, uh, uh, there's no condemnation for me. I'm, I said, listen, brother, how can you say there's no condemnation for you? The, uh, no condemnation means you will not do this. You're not condemned anymore to want to have a good life with this wife of yours, 
but now you can't have it. You are blessed with, you can have this good life now. Should you have been divorced, we're not going to try and bring guilt and uh, 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 an emotion of distance or you have sinned to you. No. But we have a life inside us that we can have God's quality of life. So I, I shared that to him. He says, no, 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 you are trying to manipulate me and whatever. I said, my brother, you are in the law. No, I'm in grace. I said, you're in the law. Because the fruit of the flesh are these things. And then mentioned in Galatians. You're in the law. Being in the law brings forth those things. And you know the thing in my life? If I see the fruit of the law or the fruit of the flesh in my life, this is the wonderful thing that removes all emotion of guilt. Paul said, it's not I who do this. But it's the sin in me that does it, and it's activated by being legalistic in some area of my life. So what I do is I can distantiate myself from the wrong I do. I don't say I'm doing this. I'm saying the sin in me is doing this, and the wrong that I can be doing is I'm believing the wrong thing. So Lord, show me the right thing to believe so that effortless new life can manifest in me. Because I don't want to sit knowing with my mind, in theory, God loves me, which he does, but he doesn't love me enough that I can experience his quality of life in this earth. This message of grace, the word grace means the following. It is the divine influence, God's influence on your belief, on your heart, plus the manifestation in the life, including gratitude. So if I say this, for instance, and you sit here and you feel guilty, okay, oh man, I've missed it, you know, I've done this wrong, I've done that wrong. There's two things you might experience. I've, I haven't condemned you unto a life of destruction, okay? You might experience what Hebrews 10 talk about, where it says correction is not nice. It says it there. To be corrected is not nice. You know, if somebody comes to me and says to me, Bertie, you know, you've even the, 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 uh, somebody wrote to us and said that they upset because they couldn't find the, the building because it don't have any board up, you know. I was very upset. And you need to put up a board at your church so that we can find the place. Okay, now he corrected me. Okay, he corrected me. Now when he corrected me, how, what did I feel? I felt corrected. <laughs> but if I, if I confused that with condemnation, I would say, this guy's from the devil. <laughs> because he's trying to condemn me now. Heerlijkheid, broer, die ouwe moet daarom die plek kan kry, is het nie. Maak my sin, man. Mens, denk nie altyd daar aan nie, want jy rijd dan tot daar, is ons makkelijk. Ok, and I mean, I've put on the internet the map, you click on the map, plus it's a picture of the building with the entrance. I mean, it's very difficult not to find. But all people don't do it that way. So, I felt corrected. Now, when you feel corrected, it's not nice. Okay, but when you yield to the correction, you can bear the peaceable fruit of righteousness. So, let's not confuse correction when our belief is corrected with Guilt and condemnation. Condemnation is not the feeling of guilt. Condemnation is the life of death manifesting in you while you desire the good, but you can never get to the good because you're under the law. Guilt is the emotion that's in your heart when you see your inability, but you must work it, and now you try to hide it. And correction is what the Bible talks about in Hebrews 10, where it's not pleasurable to have been wrong. Because you might have been very sincere in what you did. I mean, I can have a service here, very sincere to help people. And then somebody can be upset with me because of 
the board of the church. Nou, ek sal seker lang al die board op, as ek een naam gehad het vir die kerk. Maar ek het nog geen naam vir die kerk, so nou moet ek die board op, so was ek op die board. Ok, dit klink nou klein. <laughs> Say again? No name brand church. Ja, dit, dit kan nogal goed weg. <laughs> so, I mean, so you, 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 when you experience the correction, you know, I, I mean, I could have been how sincere. It doesn't matter how sincere you are. If what you have done does not produce the life and you see the truth, the fact that you've been sincere and you've tried your best can produce an emotion inside your heart of, man, you know, I've actually wasted my time in the, you know, in doing it this way, or in doing it that way. Let's not confuse that with being condemned. Because Paul came in many places in the Bible where he said, listen, and, and he would correct people. And all his correction was always towards belief. Always. Even if it, it ended up in this kind of an action. If people lived wrong, then he challenged their belief. Didn't challenge the action, he challenged the belief. He said to the people in Galatians, he says, listen guys, you had such a wonderful life under grace. Now you want to go back to the law. You're going to be stuck again with all kinds of immorality. You're going to be stuck again with all the passions of the flesh destroying your life. Why do you want to go there? You see, this good news and cannot exist outside of the emotion of being fully accepted, fully loved, fully innocent, with a God that is not sin conscious, a God that is righteousness conscious. It cannot exist outside of the platform where you have been included into the Godhead. It cannot exist. So we cannot preach works. We preach the truth. The truth believed redeems us and saves us from the condemned life of desiring good but never being able to have, have God's quality of life. And you know, when I preached about, when I looked at this, I felt, <clears throat> Lord, you know, why do I even have to preach about this? Because this is just supposed to be natural. Okay, you just, just preach the good news in the sense of Jesus paid for your sin, you're innocent before God, and the fruit must just manifest. And this is what came to my mind. Paul preached it like what I'm preaching now. Why did Paul preach it? Because the way we work is we function from the platform of understanding and belief. The Bible says when the seed was sown and was sown in the good ground, those who heard and understood was bearing fruit, 30, 60, and 100 fold. Okay? Or 160 and 30 fold, whatever you want to. They were bearing fruit. Why? Because they heard and understood. So the better we understand how this functions, the more we will see the manifestation of it. Because we are the God kind. God understands man. God understands himself. He knows how he functions. And from that understanding, he produced a being that functions as he is, from persuasion and understanding. Hallelujah. So I want to say this. Even in grace, and this is my encouragement to you, <clears throat> if you have in your life things that frustrates you, and you say, you, you know, and I want just, before I say that, let me put, that, put it this way. When we were under works righteousness, and we did things wrong, then it was always said, the person is bad, why doesn't he obey? When it's grace, then it's not the person anymore. It's that grace message. Yeah, it's that grace message. I don't produce Sunday young. But when it's the law, it's never the law message or the law preacher. It is that bad person, that bad church member. So, I want to say this. Paul said, if we, in Colossians, while we yet seek the justification by Christ, are found to be sinners. Is Christ the one that ministers that sin? He says, God forbid that. That is not true. It's because I have been rebuilding the old temple, the law, that I found this in my life. 
It's not Christ bringing it forth. It's not even you wanting it to, wanting it to come forth. It's the condemnation of the works righteousness system. Destroying people's lives. So if you are sitting with something in your life where you feel frustrated, where you feel, I wish I could get rid of this thing. I wish I can get rid of being afraid, for instance. Then you go and you quote three scriptures, I'm not going to be afraid, thank you Lord, you know I'm in grace, I'm not going to be afraid. That's not, that's not going to change your fear. Saying, I'm in grace, I have no fear, that's not going to change your fear. You need to hear something that takes away your fear. A, a revelation of the future, Christ applied to that area of life. You know? And that will take away your fear. How God needs to influence your belief on how you believe about that. And that will change you. So now, if you have something in your life that is not good, that's not beneficial, but not opbouwend or stichtend is for you, or for those around you, don't go and walk with guilt all the time. You might feel guilty in that area of life because in that area of life you're under a law. And you'll want to hide it and you want to feel guilty. But don't think that when we talk about it that we are projecting guilt to you. We're not. We want to bring correction in belief. Because correction in belief will bring forth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. It's all about what you believe. We need to understand that, people. Belief in the kingdom of God is everything. Jesus Christ came and brought forth and recreated the way we function towards God so that we can function exactly like Him from persuasion. The word persuasion means belief or faith. Faith is not a difficult thing to have. It is something that happens to you when you hear the truth. As you are persuaded, you find that persuasion brings, brings forth what you believe in. An animal doesn't have that ability. We have that ability. God has got that ability to, to have believe in something and have that which you believe in, even if you can't see it, be in your life. In the form of peace, joy, whatever you want to call it. It's called the fruit of being in the Spirit. Okay, so if you have this in your life, all you do is this. God... I want to know. I want to know what I need to believe in order to, to not to be condemned anymore to this life. I want to know what you believe about me here because your righteousness is manifested from faith to faith. There's stuff you believe about me which I don't believe, obviously. And I want to know the truth. I don't even want to know what I don't believe. I just want to believe the right thing. Because you can go into investigating your life until you're blue in the face of what wrong thing do I believe. I don't care what the wrong thing is what I believe. Because if, if you know what's the wrong thing that you believe, why will you know what's right then? So just go in the right direction from the beginning. Believing the right thing. And what helped my life and what is helping me now is believing that in, in this one of the things I've shared in Genesis with you, we've been created and blessed with the ability to have the very fruit of God. Isn't that beautiful? To be one with God and that we are the, the, the being in which Jesus reproduces who He is. And that life flows out and is reproduced in every area of my life. It's produced in how I treat my wife, how I treat my children. It's reproduced effortlessly in how I handle my finances and what I think about the church and how I think about even a law preacher. Mm. wonderful the influence of God God's quality of life and I want to say this and especially to those uh, on the internet you know I am here and, and this is in my heart I want to preach the truth and the truth is this to me it is Jesus Jesus is the truth about mankind and whatever you can believe about Jesus, you can believe about yourself. That's the truth. How he functions, who he is, believe that. Let's look at Christ's life, who he was on earth, who he is now, and what he's done, and what he's willing to do over and over 
it reveals you. And there's things that we can believe about Jesus which can be scary to believe about ourselves. The Bible says, Let this mind be in you which was in Christ, who didn't count it robbery, although he was equal with God, laid down his life even to the obedience of death to save people. You know, we are. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ, even though we are equal with God. We're not going to count it robbery to serve the least. Because, you know, any kind of life outside of that life is a mediocre life. It is not the, the quality of life that God possesses. You know, if I look at God, and I'm going to end off with this, if I look at God, and I look at what motivates Him, and the passion that's in His heart, and in His life, and what manifested in God, in Christ, so that nobody could ever doubt who God is, how much He loves sinners, how He's not a God of condemnation, how He could never condemn you unto a life of defeat, but He blesses you with a life of fruit. When I look at all that is manifesting in God, and I think for myself that there's something inside God that makes God God, that makes Him be who He is, that He is so much, like I preached last Sunday, I am that I am. And if I think of all of that, I must think this way. Anything outside of what God believes and what is brought forth in Him is just a mediocre life. It's not God's life. It's not, God's, it's not the highest form of living. We've been taught that the highest form of living is to, is, is, is to just have a lot of money, have a big house, and all those kind of things. We've been taught that. Yes. Well, it's wonderful to have a house. This morning I was on the internet and I looked at um, the white squatter camps and how the people live there. Man. You know, when I see the picture of the children... I just feel I want to empty my cupboards. You know, because I, my heart breaks when I see that. Not, you, you know, the, the poverty is not the big thing to me. Because the, the Bible says you always have the poor with you. But what blesses me is what, uh, what, 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 what hurts my heart is what do they believe? What do they believe about themselves? We're just poor whites. It's because our fathers oppressed the blacks that we are now suffering like this, bearing the curse. And who knows what do they still believe? All the lies. And I was just looking at that. I was thinking, my goodness. You know? And I, 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 what I feel in my heart is what God, I believe what God feels towards every human being that doesn't believe the truth. And He wants them to have that quality of life that He has. Now, the highest form of life that there is, is to love someone. Now, you might be shocked, but the other day I watched the Moulin Rouge again, the movie. And there's a song there that says, the, the greatest thing you ever learn is to love and be loved in return. Okay? Now, I'll change the words. The greatest thing you ever learn is to be loved and to love in return. Okay, but, but that is the greatest thing you'll ever learn, is to experience God's love and to love someone. There is no higher life than that life. There is no higher life. Climbing the ladder of, the, the corporate ladder of success by sowing and reaping, trying to get the quality of life that you think you're the blessed of God by possessing more stuff, it's a lie. It's not the truth, man. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And I'm not trying to get money. I am explaining to you, as best as what I know how, who you really are. That's who you are. Our lives, the, the, we only possess one life, Colossians says. His life is our life. We don't have any other life. And the life that we have in Colossians, the one that we look, His life is our life, is the one, is the kind of life that easily loves those who don't have. That easily blesses those that struggle. That, wants, that, that, that defines poverty, not just as not having material stuff, but sees poverty as believing the wrong thing. 
and want to do everything. Let me tell you something. If we take a plate of food and give it to a poor person, and the end of that is not designed to help him to believe the truth about himself, you've wasted a plate of food. If I visit an orphanage, but I cannot help them to believe the truth about themselves, I've wasted my time. It is a temporal thing. Because inside me and you lives a God that cannot but reproduce himself. And we are in a relationship with a husband that's going to have fruit. And you know what? I've seen people that cannot have children. I mean, they, the guy is a man and the lady, she's a woman. And they have sexual intercourse, but they cannot bear children. Do you know how, through how much counseling you need to take those people and help them and pray for them and deal with the fact that they cannot bear children? Because even in the natural, we have been designed, made. And the Bible says clear in Romans 3, by the things seen, we understand the unseen. We, we, we cannot function. You know, sometimes when I think of my three boys, I think, yeah, Jere, I must have five years of wachet. Verstaan, if all of you know the half of the dark of spring, verstaan, of, oh, here are the for me. You think of that. But I can just think if Helena and I couldn't have children. You know, it's like it would have been something that can consume us. And that can become such an unhealthy thing. You know, because you are so stressed out about it. I want to just say this. The very same thing happens in grace and in the law. We will become so fruit orientated and it will become fruit will become such an obsession that it becomes unhealthy. We don't have to be obsessed about fruit. Fruit is something natural for us. It's natural. And we don't have to be afraid of fruit. Fruit is... We, we, uh, let me tell you something. Rather be afraid of not having fruit. <laughs> because that will frustrate your life. But fruit is not... The emphasis is not on you to bear the fruit. The Bible says, union with Him, He bears His fruit. The fruit is not named after you. It's named after the husband. Like I said many times here, Abraham had a son called Isaac. It doesn't say, and Sarah had a son called Isaac. Abraham had a son called Isaac. Jesus will have fruit in us. And we say to him, be all the glory. Not to us. But know this, we cannot have a life anything less than the one. Why do you, it's like having, it's like having a very nice car and never riding it. It's like having a house at the sea and never visiting it. What does it help? We have God's quality of life, but we cannot have it. That's condemnation. So this is the difference. Condemnation in Romans 8 talks about a life condemned unto not being free by the flesh or from the flesh by the law. Guilt is the emotion that you experience when you are engaged into the law. And then there's an emotion of correctness, of being corrected, corrected by somebody, which should not be confused with either guilt or condemnation. Okay, so we will always in our lives find that God corrects our belief. Paul, in all his writings, there's not one thing Paul wrote without correcting people's belief. Not one. All the time, correcting what we believe. Because as you believe, so are you in this world. Amen. That's what manifests in this world. Let's pray. <clears throat> I want to pray for you here and people watching via the internet. Father, I want to pray for the people that are here in church this morning and those that are watching via the internet. Thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us with the ability to have who you are reproduced in our lives. And you said that you blessed, you barakt, you spoke well of, you spoke with adoration of us by saying you have the ability to have the God kind 
reproduced in you. You have the ability to function like and bring forth the very fruit of God. Thank you for that, my God. Thank that we can embrace that well speaking, that how you have baracked us. If we look at this world, and I want to pray for the people here, if they look at their jobs, where they work, if they look at the politics, if they look at things in this world, how will we have peace in this world without the fruit of the Spirit called peace? How will we have peace in the midst of all these things without having peace effortlessly come forth in our lives? And thank you, Lord, that the easiest thing, it's the easiest thing for these people to do and for myself to do and people over the, watching all over the world, the easiest thing for them to do is to sit under the good news and embrace it as the only truth. And I pray for them now. They might be strengthened in their inner man that when they hear this good news, they will not just hear it as something that can just take away the feeling of guilt. But thank you, Lord, that we can say, okay, we are not guilty anymore. We need to see the truth about ourselves. For we want to rest in and in the truth of who we really are. That there is no other life about ourselves. We don't have any other life than the Jesus Christ that mirrors who we are. Thank you for that, Father. I just pray for every person here that uh, experienced the condemnation of works righteousness in their life, where there might be an area in their life where they feel, my goodness, I wish I couldn't have lived like this, or I wish I couldn't have lived like that. Thank you, Lord, that that action can never define them, that action can never show them who they are. All that that manifests is the sin that's in the flesh. And it's not even them sinning. May they know that from the depth of their being. And may they also know the truth about themselves in that area of life, being lifted up to the place where they belong in the area of their belief, seeing the truth about themselves. Amen, amen.